I started off in Chicago working for an advertising agency and I convinced them to build a studio and to do commercials. And then at night, I'd bring my bands in, you know, and I'd get some demos and things like that. So finally, uh, I got a band that was really, really good. And I let them use the studio in exchange for letting me say I produced it. Now, I didn't really produce it, but I knew I could have produced it if I knew how. So that's how the whole thing started. I brought that out to L.A. Uh, and shopped it around. And I actually had two offers, one from Columbia and one from RCA. And um, an earthquake hit while I was out here. I was out of money, and Columbia's ceiling caved in. So I, it was RCA. That's how I made my choice. So they took me back to New York, and they said, look, you can either stay in New York, go back to L.A., or maybe you'd like to go back to Chicago because we have a big recording center there and you can kind of run the A&R show. And I thought, hmm, I don't know a lot about production. I'm going to make some mistakes. Better make them off-site. So I went back to Chicago. In Chicago, I ended up uh, signing my first artist that was my first hit, uh, a guy named B.W. Stevenson. And uh, after about a year in Chicago, they came and closed the studios, which is another story all in itself, but moved me to California. And that's how I ended up in L.A. So I end up uh, out here in California, uh, stayed a couple of years with RCA, had another hit with B.W., uh, and ultimately went independent and just about starved. I mean, I was just about ready to pack up and go home because it was, I shouldn't have gone independent nearly as soon as I did. And uh, an attorney friend of mine introduced me to Jerry Moss, which was the introduction that was going to change my whole career. And I ended up producing independently for a and uh, My first big production was Diamonds and Rust with Joan Baez. It was a major uh, multi-platinum album for her. And after I did that album, they sent me to London, and I worked out of the UK office trying to find some talent, because talent was starting to change about that time. And Elvis Costello had just kind of broken, and, and, and I saw his advertising, and I thought, this is just the coolest, you know, I, I, I just can't believe that this is this cool. And I called his manager at the time, and I said, look, if there's any way ever to produce this guy, you know, I'd really, really love to be involved. And he said, well, what makes you think you can produce an artist like Elvis? You know, you produce Cat Stevens and all these other artists. And I said, look, I, it's not about that, it's about feeling it, you know, and I really feel it. So you know, he laughed it off, and I I talked to Jerry and I said, Jerry, you got to let me stay a little bit longer. And so he said, okay, you got another month. So I'm not really even employed by a I'm just there kind of as an embassy. And the last weekend, Jerry had called and said, okay, time to come home. I hadn't found anything. By the way, we signed the police that summer. Uh, we squeeze, the tourists were the Eurythmics, Dire Straits. I mean, it was a marvelous summer for music in England. And the last Friday of that weekend, it was raining in London and it was time to go, and I had one more appointment, and I just about left, and I decided not to leave, and it came in, and it was Joe Jackson, and he walked in with, you know, Look Sharp, Sunday Papers, Is He Really Going Out With Him, and all those great songs, and uh, that was the rest of it. The rest of it was history. You know, we made a record in, in London. Actually, uh, the managing director at the time was out of town, and he was on holiday, and I don't think anyone in the London office quite knew what my real position was. They knew I was from L.A. and I talked to Jerry, so therefore, you know, so I said, well, look, we're, we're going to sign Joe Jackson. So they said, okay, cool, you know, so we actually do his contract. And we're in the studio recording when the managing director comes back from his holiday. And he says, wait a minute, what's all this? You know, what's this about? Well, luckily, um, he loved Joe Jackson, and it turned out to be a, a nice run for all of us. But shortly after coming back to the U.S., uh, I became vice president of A&R at uh, at A&M, and signed Janet Jackson, Brian Adams, uh, worked with Supertramp, worked with Peter Frampton. I pretty much supervised, you know, the whole roster at the time, and we were probably together 12 years, something like that, maybe even 13 years for the whole run. And I went independent again because uh, I was trying to produce and run the A&R department. And one day Jerry said, you know, you look horrible. <laughs> you know, you really need to make a decision if you want to be a producer or, or an A&R guy. And, and either one's fine with me. So I said, look, Jerry, I, I made a commitment. I really want to continue with A&R. I'll back off. And about two weeks into it, Joe Jackson calls and he says, David, he said, I've got this album and it's going to be my biggest album and you got to help me with it. I said, Joe, you know, I just made this, this promise to Jerry and everything. Oh, send the tape out. So he sends the tape out. And it's the Night and Day album. 
and on it, you know, is, is Stepping Out and all those great songs. So I went to Jerry and I said, Jerry, you know, I, I really got to do this. And he said, I totally understand. I want you to do it. So we left, uh, I left A&M uh, as far as being on staff. I produced that album, uh, which turned out to be a, a really nice album. And right after that, started working with Duran Duran uh, on Hungry Like the Wolf and Rio. And I was off at that point. You know, the, the, I, I bought studios, I had a publishing company, I was doing uh, soundtracks. And about, uh, I started going to Australia and doing more new artists because I love new artists, I love new music. And about that time, a friend of mine in New York named Don Rubin uh, called me and he said, would you be interested in doing an acoustic artist? And I said, are you kidding? I love to do acoustic artists. And he sent me this tape. And I remember the first time I listened to it, it was, um, it was absolutely horrible quality. But the artist was magnificent. And of course, it was Tracy Chapman. So I went back to New York. We made the deal to, to produce that album. And the, Tracy and I spent a couple of days just going through songs and, you know, talking about the way we would do it. And then the last day, you know, and I was a little concerned about songs. I thought there were some really great songs, but nothing was really sticking out. The last day she said, you know, I, I, I do have this one other song. And, uh, you know, take a listen and see if you like it. And it was all on keyboard that she had done, you know, and kind of midied and sequenced. And it was Fast Car. And I said, you know, Tracy, let's go. Let's get in the studio and, and do it. And, of course, that, again, was history. And it led to, uh, you know, to many, many other projects uh, on down through the present, you know, which I'm uh, heavily back into artist development. Uh, heavily back into production and uh, and having a great time with new music on the internet. You can be uh, an engineer, uh, you can be an arranger, you can be a programmer, you can be a babysitter. I mean, you, all the things that are necessary uh, for for being a uh, a producer are under that umbrella. But I've always specialized in being what I call an enhancement producer. In other words, I got to get it from you, and I got to feel something from you. And if you've got it, and I feel it. I'll set the stage for you and do the lighting and, and, and make the presentation happen. And because of that, you know, I'm decades into production because I've never really been the flavor of the month. I produced the flavor of the month, but I wasn't stuck in that. And, and I wasn't actually uh, pigeonholed as only being able to do that. So people call me when they've got real artists with real something to say, you know, real lyrics. And they want to be able to get the best out of them and, and make the artist the center point. because. I, I have a very strong theory of production, which is that I usually work backwards from everyone else. I usually start with the vocal and move backwards, and I frame everything around the vocal. And then, you know, when you've got a Kenny Loggins or you've got a Tracy Chapman or any of those great singers, you spotlight them and they become, you know, right in your face. They become personal and they become um, someone that you can actually feel and reach out and touch. And then when they emit their emotion, you're right there to get it. You know, they're not kind of an extra added attraction added to the track at the last minute and, uh, and, and buried somewhere. The technology has, sh has sidestepped and shortened uh, the fundamentals of recording. In other words, artists are coming up before they're ready. They're making things that sound good but aren't really, you know, underneath. And because of that, they haven't learned the fundamentals of actually making a record. And, and the fundamentals are that, in my book, you start with the, the vocal, you put a great track underneath it that's only a three-piece so that it works just like that and you don't need another thing. And then you paint by numbers, you fill in the blanks and anything is that works stays in and anything that doesn't is out of it, you know. And that's always been my theory, you know, of how to put a, a, a record together. And what I'm finding and where I'm getting a lot of uh, calls is someone that wants a professional that knows how to take the shortcuts but doesn't shortcut the quality. So you got to get in and make it, and you got to know that you're organized. You got to know exactly what you're going to do when you get in there. No writing lyrics on the spot or, or trying, you know, a hundred different things to come up with the thing. You need to know exactly what it is, and I like that because I think there's a motion and 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 a momentum that starts to go when all of that starts to move. And then I like to take a little separation from it before I mix it, you know, which I never could do in the past. You know, we would always spend it was always eight weeks deliver it and you're on to the next project. So I, I really like to take a, a little bit of time to listen to it. Uh, I don't know whether the other guys are doing it, but uh, I mix everything in stems. 
so that uh, when I want to remix, I don't have to come into a studio again. I can just sit there and, and change the balances, and we master off the stems. So all the effects, all the sounds are already there. For some reason, the bouncing down to even to disc versus just taking the stems and running it through better converters and better compression and so forth gives you a little bit more transparent sound and it's a little bit punchier. But the nice thing about it is that you could even sit with an LE system or an O2 or an O3 and make all the changes you, you want to twiddle in the mix and not have to be in a studio you know running up hours because what a stem does is it prints on each track all of the effects, all of the EQ, any compression, it's just a record but it's you know 48 tracks or, or 30 tracks whatever it is so when you play it it's the mix and then anything that you adjust you know in between when the mastering guy plays it it's it's done I do everything with Bob Ludwig and I think he's probably you know a genius and and just a wonderful wonderful mastering engineer things have changed though you know when I was producing um, a lot of records and working with Bob it was vinyl and and you were cutting discs and discs Mastering disc is a whole different animal than, than mastering digital because there were other considerations, you know, as you moved into the center, you lost high end, uh, there was a time constraint, uh, the pressings would come out different than the, than the mother plates, so you had to compensate for that. None of that is really uh, a factor in, in digital. So I found, and because Bob is on the East Coast, I found a guy uh, locally who was at Capitol named uh, Mark Chalecki. And I just give him uh, big applause and big accolades because he and I work great together. And, and the thing that I can do with him that I've never been able to do with mastering before is, is actually master a, a track and go out to my car and listen to it, make changes, come in, go out and make changes, come in. And I've never had that luxury before because the, the end process of mastering is extremely important. And it's much more than just adding, you know, some high end or some mid range and throwing some compression on it. I mean, it's it's really thought out because you know you can hear if you if you're listening you know, know how to listen a, a half a db and it just shifts the whole balance of the mix so you have to listen on a great system and being able to have the luxury as i say of, of going back and forth it makes better records played on the ranch and all of a sudden uh, i wasn't getting these same kind of projects they were calling and saying wait a minute you know you'd be great for this. And I listen to it and I go, wow, I love this, you know. And all of a sudden it's time to make records again. And it's fun, it's, uh, it's stimulating and exciting. And it's so great because you have a hand in what happens to it after you make it. You know, it used to be that uh, there was the only game in town was the majors and the distribution and the radio promotion. But that's not the way it is today. So, you know, you turn a record over that you fall in love with and, and you're at the mercy of a number of different things, not excluding your own company. That doesn't exist today. Today, you have a hand and can have a hand in the whole launching of a career. And it's fun to take things and functions that we learn, you know, in big record companies and apply them to today's uh, internet uh, technology. I think it's great. It's really, really a lot of fun. Music Pros Hollywood is a destination site for artist development, but it also has lessons and things that people can uh, can look through and hopefully learn from. But that, along with the David Kirschenbaum Productions.com site, is offering my production um, at aimed completely at new artists to be able to take a new artist in and make them not feel afraid to contact me. You know, I, I email managers. I, I have it on the net let me hear your music you know I, I'm, I'm thrilled to find the new artist that I'm excited about and I can make it work you know I can make it work on various different levels of budget so I want to obviously have enough money to make a great record but at the same time bring it on you know, let me hear it it's really better to do things in different environments um, and and it's better to go to a real mixing room than to try to build one yourself where it's proven uh, it's better to go to a, a great tracking studio that has a room that's seasoned for 30 or 40 years like Sunset or Conway or Capitol or one of those great rooms and then the rest of it is is very one-on-one -on -one intimate I mean you can do it basically with a, a nice little room and a Pro Tools system so I gradually have found myself going away from uh, having equipment and, and doing it and, and more leaning toward uh, making the right deals at the right places and putting enough volume through that it makes sense financially you know no matter how much I tried to keep up every time I bought something in a couple of months it was obsolete and I just got tired of trying to do that because 
artists are going to want it. They're going to come in. People that want to use the room are going to come in and they're going to go, oh, wait a minute, you know, you don't have 8.0 and 2.9 and all this stuff. And, and you end up having to uh, satisfy a lot of people. If you do it on your own, it's great, but you don't have the advantage of going to these other places. So the way I solved it is I don't really speculate. I produce young groups that have budgets. And I'm not saying they're major record company budgets, but everyone that comes to me is self-funded in some manner, you know, whether through themselves or a relative or an investor. And we make intelligent records that sound great that don't cost what the, what the majors had to pay to do them. And that's, that's kind of my niche where I'm operating. Right artists that have worked with me and in their press or work with me feel like that I have a very deep emotional and spiritual connection to them and almost to the, to the number everyone has said that I've gotten the best out of them that they can possibly get. And I think that's true because there's a lot of different ways to produce an artist. You know, you can be a dictator and pound them. Uh, that'll come back and bite you. But I tend to work more on uh, being a, a, a fifth member of a four-piece band or, you know, a partner to a singer-songwriter and collaborating to the degree that I can help them set up an environment to get their best work. In other words, all of them, to a degree, freeze up when the red light goes on. You know, it just, it's human nature. All of a sudden, there's something that's worth something. In other words, this is going to mean something. There's some value attached to this performance. And I've been really successful uh, with vocals and with uh, particularly performing artists to set up an environment that uh, is comfortable, to, that allows them and actually encourages them to do their best work. And I think that uh, if I had to say anything, uh, I fall in love with the music. You know, I, I don't do it unless I really feel it. And if I fall in love with the music, that's my total concentration that's my total focus and I try to take you know all the years of experience and put that into it so that I don't necessarily have to change you but when you run up against a problem I can give you five things to correct it you know five alternatives because I've been there some way or another in the past there is no substitution for the idiosyncrasies of musicians playing off of each other because things happen uh, it slows up but, you know it gets a little faster tension release all of those things that a computer just isn't going to do and the, it it's human and it has mistakes and it isn't perfect and it's wonderful you know because of that and that's what we loved about all those old records and it's funny I'll go back and listen to records that I love from the past and I have, have them in my mind as remembering them a certain way and I listen to them and I go whoa what was I thinking you know the drum sounds trashy and horrible and the vocals bright and all that but it all added up to something and it all had some sort of an emotional effect and, and the, the thing is is that we're still listening to those records and I don't know how many uh, of the records that are made in the other way you know 10 or 20 years from now will still uh, value and say these these were great records and I think it's probably the most exciting time for an artist that's existed in music since I can remember because for the first time an artist isn't restricted or constricted to, to please somebody all they can they can feel free to experiment. They can come up with something that's so magical and so different and so unique. And if it's, if it's handled correctly, I, I think sheer word of mouth, and I believe in viral marketing, I think people hear these things and they're great. And if they're set up right and you know where to buy it and there's a way to buy it, I think it's going to work. Now, we're not going to see, in my opinion, 20 million sale blockbusters like we've seen in the past. But I think we're going to see a lot of important records uh, come out of, this, out of this system. Records today, just like they always have been, are, are a billboard. You know, they're, they're the medium to introduce yourself, particularly singles, to, uh, to your audience. And their real money is going to come in touring, as it always has, and merchandising. And the only way to do that is to, is to regionalize and pocket market uh, to actually build and spread a fan base so that you have a, a demand. Too many people come to me and they say, look, I, I want to make an album. And I say, why? You know, what's, why do you want to make an album? You know, make a, a great couple of singles, make an EP, but who wants to buy it? Nobody knows you. Why, where are they going to buy your album? Why do you want to spend that kind of money and time? I'd much rather have uh, a couple of great cuts and some great promotion and publicity behind something that's really cool and unique than to make an album that just sits there and nobody knows it's there and really nobody cares. The record industry, not the record business, but the industry tanked was that people got fed up spending $17 on a track that they got home only to find that the rest of the thing was garbage, you know. It, it was unfair and it led people to actually say, I'm going to take it. I'll go to Napster and I'll take it. I'm not going to pay this for it. And I think as an industry, we didn't develop 
our artists the way we used to. We didn't make great records. We didn't make records worth owning. And so it's no wonder that this, uh, that this has happened. Now, I think that's going to change. And, and it's certainly changed because now you can hear a record before you buy it. You never could. You know, now you can go sample on iTunes all the cuts and you know what you're getting. You know, where before it was like a, a, a mystery package. You know, you'd hear a song and open it up and only to find that the rest of it is just garbage. What I'm finding uh, is that I'm getting an incredible amount of projects offered. And out of that, when I weed them down and I get to the ones that I really feel like I can contribute something to, there's some really great talent. And my view is what I want to be able to do is not hand them to them when it's finished and say, you know, good luck, but I want to be able to carry it through and have the other functions uh, organized that we can say, right, here's what we're going to do now. We got this, we're going to put it here, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and be able to offer more of a, of a functional uh, infrastructure, you know, to help actually market and promote and, and work those records. And I've tried to do that, you know, starting record companies. I actually started a couple of record companies, and one was a, a real big one. And the thing that I found is I always had that dream. I think every producer would love to say, oh, right, now I've made this record. I want to be involved in what happens to it. You know, I want to be able to call some, some favors and some shots and, and really try to make it happen. Before, that, that wasn't possible. It was just too big and it was too expensive. But it's possible now. You know, it's, it's possible. And it, I think that's a, a natural extension of making the music is that the artists and the people that created it have great ideas about what to do with it and who to reach with it because they conceived it in the first place. These times are really scary times for people. Mm -hmm. And they're times that, uh, that people can get really easily discouraged by you know, the, the financial con conditions, watching GM you know, collapse. I mean, big icons that you never thought would, uh, would ever be in this kind of position. And through that, I think people can get easily discouraged. And uh, what we were saying is, it's really an encouraging time. And it's great for musicians and for music because when this thing happens, people collectively come together as a group and and they share common fears they share common joys and as was demonstrated in in the 1920s and the 1930s which luckily I wasn't around for but the depression entertainment actually did very very well because people want to escape you know they want to get out of uh, their problems and their routine and go lose themselves in something so what I would say to anyone out there that's thinking about making music is let people lose themselves in your music. You know, use this time and, and capture this moment because there, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, it's, it's sad, it's tragic for so many people, but for a musician who wants to create and wants to say something, it's an unusually wonderful opportunity.